Island Crimes and Mysteries with Newells. Hey guys, welcome to Ireland Crimes and Mysteries, the podcast channel that takes you on a journey through the dark and mysterious side of Ireland's history. From infamous crimes to unsolved mysteries, we explore the stories that have captivated and intrigued people to this very day. Join us as we uncover the stories behind these cases. Whether you're a true crime enthusiast or a lover of all things mysterious, this is the podcast for you. So sit back, relax, grab a cup of coffee, and let's explore the dark side of Ireland together. This podcast has been compiled from information gathered in the public sphere, like news articles and documentaries. Everything in this podcast is alleged unless a conviction has taken place. Words that come to mind when you mention the West of Ireland. Rugged, picturesque, isolating, breathtaking. History, tourism, mountain sheep, stone walls, Irish traditional music, the country pub and friendly people. The West of Ireland is all of these and more. Who can ever visit Connemara or venture out to the Iron Islands or visit Galway City without any of these words being used to describe the place? But back in Victorian times, Ireland was under British rule and part of Great Britain. The reigning monarch was Queen Victoria and the west of Ireland, along with the rest of Ireland, was a very different place to the Ireland we know today. Our story takes us back to 1882. The country had not yet recovered from the famine of 1845 to 1852. Known also as the Great Hunger, a vast amount of the population of Ireland starved to death as a result of the failure of the potato crop, of which one third of the population depended totally on for food. It is also widely stated that the British government did not help matters by refusing to ban the export of food from Ireland during this time period. Approximately one million people died from starvation and disease, while a further one million are thought to have emigrated. A quarter of the population lost. The west of Ireland was one of the hardest hit parts of the country. County Mayo in particular, where an estimated nine-tenths of the population depended on the potato crop. Mam Trasna, the setting for our story, was an extremely remote townsland in County Mayo, near the shores of Loch Mask and the Partry Mountains. Mam Trasna, translated roughly from Irish, means mountain pass crossing. This area had a population of roughly 100 residents, all dotted along the pass in approximately 21 tiny stone huts with attached roofs. Here the residents farmed their small pieces of mountainous land, which consisted of poor soil and rocky terrain. It was a Gwaeltocht area, meaning the residents were Irish speakers, none of whom spoke English. Galway City was some 40 miles away, while the village of Conn was 27 miles away. The nearest police hut was a distance of eight miles, and if you needed a doctor, the nearest was ten miles away. All of which, in a time where your only way to get around was a horse and trap or by foot, meant that the people of Mantrasna rarely, if ever, saw a stranger or knew anything about life beyond their own village surroundings. They lived in extreme poverty. Their tiny little stone huts consisted of one, maybe two, extremely sparse and cold rooms, which housed large families as well as some of the farm animals who would be kept indoors from the harsh weather or thieves who would sometimes steal an animal in desperation if their own families were starving. The heat would be from a turf fire where the smoke escaped through a hole in the roof along with any of the heat admitted from the fire. These people, our ancestors, existed in extremely hard and subhuman conditions that most of us today wouldn't even fathom. On the night of Thursday, the 17th of August, 1882, John Joyce, his wife Bridget, his mother Maraid and his children from his first marriage, daughter Peggy and sons Michal and Patsy, were at home in their small stone dwelling when they were savagely attacked in a crime that would go down in history for not only the crime itself, but all that followed. What took place in the hut that night would go unnoticed until the following morning when John Collins, a neighbour, walked up to the Joyce's hut to borrow something. He noticed that the wooden front door had been bashed in and was lying in the front room off the hinges. At this moment he became glaringly aware of the quietness that surrounded him. 
There wasn't a sign of the family as he moved closer to the homestead. He nervously approached the front door to investigate why it was off the hinges when his eyes fixed on John Joyce. To his absolute horror, he witnessed John lying there on the floor, not moving. At this point, he turned on his heels and ran for help. On his return to the hut, John, along with other neighbours, entered the dwelling where John Joyce was still lying dead after being shot twice. But this was only the beginning of the nightmare scene that was laid out before them. John Joyce's mother, Maraid, his wife, Bridget, and daughter, Peggy, were also dead all having sustained horrific wounds to the head and body from what looked like a blunt object like a hammer. In a small room behind the main room where the family lay, John Joyce's two sons, Michal and Patsy, lay seriously wounded, both having been shot, but mercifully they were still alive. Michal said he had seen three men, but could not identify them as it was so dark. The whole neighbourhood was shocked and aghast as the news of the murder started to filter out. The men that had found the family were left traumatised by what they had witnessed. A meeting was held by the locals and a plan was hatched about what to do next. People were worried and sceptical of each other because of the remoteness of Mamtrasna. It had to be a local. If there were any strangers in the area, they would definitely have been noticed. No one felt safe. While the two-hour meeting took place, Michal and Patsy lay dying in the hut. People afraid to offer help as no one knew why this had happened or who had done it. And if they were seen to help the remaining family members, they could be in danger themselves. It was decided the police should be alerted and a group of men from the village started out on the eight mile journey to the police hut in Finney. In the meantime, no one re-entered the house to help the wounded boys. The fear and suspicion of the locals was palpable, so the poor boys were left lying on the floor in severe pain slowly succumbing to their wounds. By the time the police arrived later that day, the scene had become even more barbaric. Animals had started gnawing at the deceased in the front room and the two boys were barely alive in the other room. At around 3pm, Michal died from his injuries. He had been shot behind the ear. The poor lad endured an excruciating end. A short while later, the local magistrate arrived at the homestead and asked some of the local women would they take in the youngest boy, Patsy. He even offered them money, but every one of them refused, all petrified that if they were seen to help any member of the family, they would be the next target of the killer or killers. They also did not want the police sniffing around them asking questions. To be seen as a police informant in Ireland in those times meant you and your family would be shunned or worse. Patsy mercifully survived the attack after a doctor, Robert McDowell from Dublin, happened to be in the area and heard of the attacks and travelled to Mam Trasna to see if he could help or be of any assistance and he attended to Patsy, saving his life. A wake was held for all the deceased members of the Joyce family that very evening. An account from that day's events in the Daily Express dated Friday, August 21st, 1882, describes it as follows. Considerable number of men and women gathered at the Joyce's house and set up a low wailing keen for the dead. Keen, the anglicised version of queen, means cry in Irish. This was a common practice at wakes back then. The account continues. The women dressed in red petticoats and shawls sat close together on the grass smoking clay pipes. Some wept loudly Others lamented and gazed steadily at the house, watching every movement the constabulary made. Martin Joyce, John's other son, who worked away from home as a farm labourer, arrived back that evening in the company of police officers who were protecting him in case whoever did this would try and kill the two surviving members of the family. Police also went undercover amongst the gathering crowd, dressed in peasant clothing, hoping to overhear conversations from the locals addressing what had happened or their thoughts on what may have happened, or if they'd any suspicions as to who may have carried out these horrendous crimes. They knew the community would not be forthcoming with information or approach a police officer with their suspicions. Locals did not trust the constabulary or want to be seen as snitching on a neighbour or family member. As it turned out, the undercover police gathered no information of significance. 
But the police, despite the lack of evidence or leads, had their own ideas on why the murders happened. Since the famine times, Ireland and particularly the west of Ireland had been hit hard and little to no recovery was seen in these very isolated parts of the country. Tensions remained high in the area between neighbours and family members. Trust was in poor supply. Disease and starvation had decimated the village for years. Some villages had been completely wiped out. Despite this, the population of Mamtrasna had managed to recover, with over a 100 people living in the village and the surrounding area. Regardless, people still had starvation to deal with and the land they lived on got smaller with each generation as it was divided between sons. The theft of sheep was on the increase and was a big factor in the mistrust between neighbours. John Joyce was under suspicion locally of being involved in the theft of sheep from his neighbours and then selling them. Three years prior to the murders in 1879, a major catastrophe had hit the west of Ireland. The potato crop had failed again that year and people not only could not pay their rent, but also starved to death. Landlords threatened to evict anyone who could not pay their increasing rents, showing no mercy, burning families out of their meagre homesteads, leaving them with nowhere to go. Resistance to the evictions in the form of the Land League grew in numbers. The Land War, as it became known, was a peaceful resistance in most parts of the country, but it was violent in the West where poverty and starvation was higher than other parts of the country, with many murders taking place. Mamtrasna and the surrounding areas saw some of this violence. In 1880, a local landlord called Lord Mount Morris had threatened eviction on one of his tenants, Patrick Sweeney. This proved fatal for Lord Mount Morris, who was shot and killed in Clonbur, County Galway, which is 10 miles from Mamtrasna. No one was ever convicted for his murder, although suspicion did lie at the door of Patrick Sweeney. Then in June 1882, Clonbur saw another murder, which some people linked to the Mamtrasna murders. Joseph Huddy and his grandson John Huddy, who lived near Conn, were en route to serve an eviction notice for a major landlord, Arthur Guinness, whom Joseph was the bailiff for. They were both shot and killed by a mob and their bodies weighed down and dumped in Loch Mask. The bodies were recovered after a tip-off and after a lengthy investigation, three men, Patrick Higgins, Thomas Higgins and Michael Flynn, were hanged in Galway Jail in January 1883 for their murders. To this day, the descendants of Patrick and Thomas Higgins maintain their innocence. One theory for the possible motive for the killing of the Joyce family was that old Mrs Joyce, or John Joyce himself, had given information to the RIC on where the bodies of Joseph and John were buried. Another rumour floating about at the time was that John's teenage daughter Peggy was seen flirting with a police officer. But as I said, this is just a rumour but any of the above could be a possible motive for the killings. Meanwhile, back in Mamtrasna on the 19th of August, the place was overrun with police officers and journalists. The murders had become big news and had even reached the shores of Great Britain and into the newspapers there. George Bolton, the Crown Solicitor, arrived in Mamtrasna on the Saturday after the murders. He was the prosecutor in the case and known to be a brutal prosecutor, but good at his job, known for his high conviction rate. But the investigation was going to prove difficult with many obstacles. The community was remaining tight-lipped, no one willing to speak for fear of reprisal. Not only that, but there was many cultural differences as well as the language barrier. Most of the villagers did not speak English. Translators were needed, which made the investigation slow and arduous. The police looked down on the villagers, seeing them more as one step up from the animals in the fields than human beings, calling them unfortunate creatures in their miserable surroundings, living in such isolation, ignorant to the English language, civilization, and laws. This thought process put the people of Mamtrasna at an immediate disadvantage and an unequal footing from the start of the investigation. 48 hours after the murders, a man named Big John Casey, who rumours had said was one of the farmers John Joyce had stolen the sheep from, was arrested. He was released within hours. Post-mortems were carried out but shed no further light on a possible suspect. 
Three days into the investigation, three witnesses walked the eight miles to Finney and told the officer they had witnessed the murders and could identify 10 people who were involved. They went to Finney to avoid being seen talking to the police investigating at Mamtrasna. They said they would be willing to make statements and testify. A magistrate was summoned and they all testified under oath, surely signing the death warrant of all those they had testified against, notwithstanding the fact that they were putting their own lives in danger by informing on their neighbours. It could potentially get them killed. The police put them up in con for their own safety and ten houses were raided that night around Mamtrasna and all the named suspects were arrested. A few days after the murders, the burials of the Joyce family took place in a small cemetery between Mam Trasna and Ballinrobe. Mrs Joyce being buried with her first husband and the rest of the family interred together. In the space of three days, the people of Mam Trasna had witnessed an unspeakable mass murder, the arrest of ten locals, three informants in protective custody and five burials. Saturday the 19th of August 1882, the world had learned about the heinous murders in Mam Trasna in the west of Ireland. All the papers had it as their front page exclusive. This put the government in London and the police under pressure to get a conviction. The British public were out for blood with the current climate of the land wars and unrest. While the land wars raged in Ireland, the government had been heavily criticised for how they'd handled it all. In May 1882, the Chief Secretary for Ireland and his Under Secretary had been assassinated. Lord Frederick Cavendish was murdered hours after arriving in Dublin in the Phoenix Park. He had just taken the oath of Chief Secretary in Dublin Castle and was walking through the park with Thomas Henry Burke, the Under Secretary, when they were attacked by a group of nationalist terrorists known as the National Invincibles, a radical breakaway group from the Irish Republican Brotherhood, and they both died. Known as the Phoenix Park Murders, five men were convicted and hanged for the murders in Kilmainham Jail between the 14th of May and the 9th of June 1883. Law and order seemed out of control during this period, so the high-profile killings of a family in a remote part of Ireland caused immense pressure on the powers that be to catch and convict the murderer or murderers as quickly as possible. Over a hundred police officers were assigned to Mam Trasna in order to enforce the law under any means necessary. Swift justice was called for. Despite the abundance of police in Mam Trasna, the locals continued to be far from helpful as they held the law in nothing but contempt, distrusting them intensely. So having three men come forward stating they had witnessed and could name the murderers was a massive coup for the police. After the ten men were arrested and remanded in custody, evidence was heard at a special hearing of the magistrate's court, with no legal representation present for the men at this time. The informants were present as well as the ten accused. They all knew each other. Some were neighbours, others were relatives. This would stir tensions in the small little village to boiling point for sure. The three informants were questioned by the magistrate and gave their version of events of that night for what they had allegedly witnessed. This is the account given by one of the informants, a man named Anthony Joyce, who happened to be a first cousin of John Joyce, the murdered man, and also a cousin of one of the men he had accused. He stated as he recounted what allegedly happened that he was asleep when barking dogs woke him up around midnight. He went to investigate why the dogs were barking when he saw six men passing his house. He knew them all and he could identify them. He also stated that he knew by them they were up to no good. He ran to his brother John's house to alert him as he thought they were headed to him, but they walked past his house. They decided to follow them to see what they were up to. His nephew also went along and they saw four more men join the posse. The ten men then headed to John Joyce's house. Anthony, his brother and his nephew hid from sight behind a bush. He saw three men break in the door and enter the house, but couldn't say which tree it was as it was so dark. He said he then heard screaming coming from within the house. At this point he said they decided to flee for fear of being spotted after events appeared to take a violent turn. They went straight home and never contacted the police. This evidence was sufficient to remand the 10 men in custody in Galway Jail. 
Some were sceptical of Anthony Joyce's testimony and that of his brother and nephew. How could they identify all ten men? It was a dark night and Anthony had stated they could not identify the three that had gone into the house, meaning they could not identify the actual murderers. Plus, why had they not gone to Finney and alerted the police that night? They did not come forward until a few days had passed by. The ten men were in a completely different world when they were plucked from their homes in rural Mamtrasning and incarcerated in Galway Jail, where only English was spoken, so none of the men had a clue what was happening to them, as they spoke only Irish. They set through their hearing, which was conducted through English, probably terrified and feeling completely out of their depths, listening to a foreign language, knowing their fates were being discussed, but not having a clue what was being said about what they were being accused of or what was going to happen to them. Their lives were on the line and they were potentially innocent. This did not seem to bother the magistrate or the police, who just wanted a conviction. Nothing else mattered. The three informants were kept in con barracks for their own protection. The whole village was upended by what had happened. Practically every house in the village was affected by the events that had taken place, as either fathers, husbands, brothers, sons, uncles or cousins were arrested, making it impossible for the three informants to safely return home. The general consensus in the village was that not all the accused were guilty. One of the accused men, Anthony Feldman, had been witnessed to be at another wake the night the murders took place, miles from the scene itself, making it impossible for him to be back in time to carry out the brutal attack. This was only the beginning of the nightmare for all involved. The ten accused were kept apart at Galway Jail. They could not converse with each other and were held in single cells. And to make matters worse, their solicitor, Henry Concannon, had no Irish. So communication was through a translator, making it a very laborious process indeed. Information literally getting lost in translation. On Saturday the 26th of August there was another hearing, but this time their solicitor was present. This hearing was adjourned until September the 3rd to give their solicitor time to build a case. These proceedings would last two days until the 5th of September. The odds were certainly not in the accused's favour as a new act had been passed in Parliament called the Prevention of Crimes Act after the Phoenix Park murders, making the laws for those accused of murder even tougher. It allowed trials to be heard in a different location, miles away from where the crime had actually been committed. The prosecution successfully argued for the trial to be held in Dublin. This was not very good news for the accused as a Dublin jury were certainly more likely to convict. The jury would consist of people of a different class from the Mantrasna men. A class of people that saw the accused as nothing more than feral. This jury would also come to the trial with a certain amount of bias, having more than likely read some of the various news articles that were less than favourable to the accused. But this would not be the only blow for the men before the trial even began. While the men sat languishing in their cells prior to the trial, another calamity was in store for them. This would happen when Anthony Philbin, one of the accused men, turned and would be produced at trial for the prosecution to collaborate the three informant stories, stating he had participated and could back up the stories of the informants. Later, as the trial began, Tom Casey, another of the accused, turned and changed his statement too. George Bolton, Crown Prosecutor, had visited the men in jail prior to the trial. Anthony had bowed to pressure to change his story, turning Queen's evidence, leaving nine to face trial. The prospect of avoiding the hangman and walking free playing a massive deciding factor in his change of heart. Without turning some of the men, the prosecution's case was flimsy to say the least. All they had was the word of three informants who could not identify who had actually entered the house that night. As stated, Anthony was the first to change his statement. He was the man witnessed to be at the wake that night and not even present at the Joyce's house, but nevertheless he went along with changing his story in return for freedom. He said he could name the three men who entered the house and killed the family. His new statement taken and signed three days prior to the start of the trial. Tom Casey was reluctant to change his statement. He admitted to being present that night, but stated Anthony Philbin was not there. 
He also stated that none of the men accused were present that night and the real killers were still walking free back in Mamtrasna. Bolton threatened Casey, as if this information made it out into the public, it would surely collapse the case. Despite this, he was not inclined to change his story. On top of all this, their solicitor, Henry Concannon, was finding it hard to put a legal team together, as no one of note wanted to be associated with the case. The ten men had been transferred from Galway to Kilmainham Jail in October prior to the commencement of the trial. On November 1st, 1882, the trials were set to begin in Green Street Courthouse in Dublin, but did not commence until the 13th of November. The prosecution were under pressure to get a conviction, which they believed would send a clear message about who was in charge in Ireland. They were going to do whatever it took to get that conviction. The accused men were in the fight for their lives. A guilty verdict meant certain death at the hands of the hangmen. When the trial began, the accused men were asked what they pled, guilty or not guilty, but were unable to enter pleas as they did not understand the question which was asked through English. A translator was called to the courthouse who turned out to be a police officer. All pled not guilty and would be tried separately. This was the point when Tom Casey relented after fear got the better of him and he said he would change his statement, willing to testify against the other men in exchange for his freedom. He collaborated Anthony's statement. This put the prosecution's case in a much stronger position, having the three informants as well as two of the ten accused willing to back up their statements and actually name who went into the house. The prosecution laid out the crime scene, stating John Joyce had been shot twice, as well as the two boys, Michal and Patsy. They stated how the women in the family had been killed differently, John's wife Bridget had her skull caved in with a blow over the right eye with a blunt object. Maraid, John's mother, had also died from blunt force to the head. Peggy, his daughter, was also bludgeoned to death. A truly shocking scene. Patrick Joyce was the first to stand trial. Anthony Philman testified explaining how the men had gathered and made their way to the Joyce house. Knowing everything he said was a lie, as he wasn't even there that night. He pointed to Patrick Joyce and named him as one of the three men who had kicked the door in and entered the house. He said Patrick had a revolver, but he gave no reason as to why any of this had happened. He said he had just went along oblivious to what was about to happen. He did contradict some of what the three witnesses had said they had seen, but the defence never challenged it. Tom Casey was next with his statement. His testimony contradicted Anthony's, as he went on to say on the stand that two of the men that entered the house were not actually on trial. So what did this actually mean? Was there 12 men there that night? Or are there innocent men on trial? It was obvious somebody was not telling the truth. But astonishingly, again, it was not challenged by the defence. The defence tried to poke holes in the three informant stories, saying they only gave the names of people they did not like, but the jury did not buy it. When the jury went in to deliberate on Patrick's fate, the prosecution had still given no motive for the murders. After eight minutes, the jury returned proclaiming Patrick Joyce guilty. He was sentenced to death by hanging. The execution to be carried out on the 15th of December at Galway Jail. He was removed from the dock and a new jury assembled for the next man named Patrick Casey. His trial played out in a similar fashion to that of Patrick Joyce's. His mother testified trying to give him an alibi but ended up stumbling over her words and contradicting herself which did not go over well with the jury. He was also found guilty and sentenced to death after 12 minutes of deliberation by the jury. The third man to stand trial was Miles Joyce who was a first cousin of two of the informants Anthony and John Joyce as well as the victim John Joyce. Miles Joyce had had a long-standing feud going on with these cousins. Anthony and John would go on to testify that Miles was one of the men who entered the house that night. Miles hailed from a place called Capanacreha, County Galway, where he farmed a small plot of land. He was, like the others, an Irish speaker. His only alibi was his wife, who was adamant he was at home with her the night of the murders. But she was not legally allowed to testify in his defence. She vehemently supported her husband, even writing to the Freeman's Journal appealing for his release. 
Before his trial actually began, the Attorney General had asked his defence solicitor, Henry Concannon, if he understood English. The interpreter then asked Miles if he would understand the evidence and he replied in the affirmative with a hand gesture. Because of this, they assumed he understood everything and the interpreter was dismissed. His defence never even challenging this dismissal. The interpreter would only be brought back to translate the guilty verdict, which was reached by the jury after just six minutes of deliberation. Miles only learning his fate when it was translated back to him in Irish. His reply to the verdict was translated by the interpreter, Constable Evans, and is as follows. He says that God and the Blessed Virgin above him, that he had no dealings with it any more than the person who was never born. That against anyone for the last 20 years he never did any harm, and if he did, that he may never go to heaven. That he is as clear of it as the child that was not yet born. That on the night of the murders he slept in his bed with his wife, and that he had no knowledge of it whatsoever. He also says that he is quite content with whatever the gentleman may do with him and that whether he be hanged or crucified, he is as clear and as free of the crime as he can be. Patrick Joyce and Patrick Casey, who had already been found guilty and sentenced to hang, both stated that Miles was innocent two days before their own executions. They admitted their own guilt, but were adamant Miles was not there that night. Five men still remained to stand trial, Two of them were brothers of Miles Joyce. The prosecution were happy enough having secured three death penalties for the five remaining to get life if they pleaded guilty, stating that they were at the house that night. The first four refused to plead guilty. The last man would change his plea if the others would also. He was a man named Michael Casey, a 60-year-old man, and he was one of the actual guilty party having admitted to his own solicitor that he was there on the night and that the others involved were still not arrested. He also says that Miles Joyce was not there that night. Although he actually was guilty, he refused to plead guilty unless the other men did also. But they refused point blank to, insisting they were innocent. His trial went ahead. The defence not wanting any more death sentences asked the local parish priest to meet with the men in Kilmainham and try to convince them to plead guilty. He managed to do so and before the verdict in Michael's case, the trial was paused. All five men pleaded guilty. A death sentence was handed down but it was advised to be commuted to life, which at the time was approximately 20 years. This would be debated over the next few weeks. Clemency was requested for the five men who pled guilty. But the three men sentenced to death had no chance of such a luxury, as they were believed to be the three that had entered the house. The people of Mam Trasner heard the news but kept their heads down, despite most of them having seen Anthony Fullman at the wake, making it impossible for him to be at the murder scene that night. They also knew that Miles Joyce, who was sentenced to death, was innocent. Two days before the executions were due to take place, a decision was made on the five who pled guilty. Life in prison. Also that day, the 13th of December, Patrick Casey and Patrick Joyce signed statements in front of the Governor and the Chief Warder of Galway Jail, admitting their own guilt and acknowledging that Miles Joyce was indeed innocent, stating he had not even been present at the Joyce home that night. They had already admitted their guilt to the prison chaplain through the confessional and advised him of Miles' innocence. They purported to the guilt of Thomas Casey, Michael Casey and three others who were never arrested, stating Thomas Casey had three revolvers and did all the shooting. Two of the men not arrested had hammers and killed those who were not shot. Patrick Joyce said that the Joyces who had sworn against us did not nor could not have seen us the night of the murder. Patrick Casey agreed with this. They reiterated that Anthony Philbin was not even there that night. Patrick Joyce claimed that the motive was spite, but never elaborated on that. Almost everyone who had taken the stand had lied in their testimony, and it appeared that some of those who organised or participated in the murders were still walking free. The new testimonies were sent to Lord Lieutenant Earl Spencer in Dublin, a great-granduncle of Diana, Princess of Wales, 48 hours prior to when the executions were to take place. 
The general feeling was that Miles would get a retrial on this new testimony. After all, what did Patrick Joyce and Patrick Casey have to gain from saying he was innocent? They were already found guilty and sentenced. Queen Victoria had also been consulted about the case during the deliberations of the last five men to stand trial and had said she backed the execution of all eight to send a message that this kind of savagery would not be tolerated. The declarations were discarded by Lord Lieutenant Spencer and the executions of the three men was set to go ahead on the 15th of December 1882. He'd been heavily criticised for commuting the five prisoners, so was under pressure to carry out Miles's death sentence. Late Thursday evening, he sent a telegram with his decision to Galway Jail. The governor of the jail delivered the telegrams to the prisoners himself. It read, Having considered the statements, I am unable to alter my decision. The law must take its course. The weather on the morning of the executions was in keeping with the events that were about to take place. It was a dark, gloomy, rainy day. The prisoners were woken from their slumber at 6am for breakfast, but refused it. No doubt they had little appetite for food given the circumstances they found themselves in. The prisoners had their hands bound and were led to the yard at 8am. They were placed over the trap doors and had their feet bound. A hood was put over their heads and the lever was pulled at 8.25am. Patrick Joyce and Patrick Casey were said to be calm, but Miles Joyce fought and shouted in Irish as they were led to the gallows. His screams and declarations of innocence went on deaf ear as no one there understood his Celtic tongue. As the hangman, William Harwood, released the trap door, Miles was still shouting out his innocence and trashing around. This caused the rope to get tangled up in the hangman's arm, which caused poor Miles to start writhing around in agony, gasping for breath and holding the noose, desperately trying to stay alive as long as he could, to the horror of all the onlookers. Eventually, the hangman detangled himself and kicked Miles into infinity, after a sufferable end, no doubt. A black flag was then raised over the prison to alert the people waiting outside the jail that the executions had taken place and the prisoners were dead. They were cut down an hour later and buried in the prison grounds. But the story did not end with their deaths. Lots of people felt a grave injustice had taken place and the real truth of what had actually happened had not yet been settled. There was no motive for the killings, an almost certain innocent man had been put to death and four of those serving life were more than likely to be innocent too. The whole thing just did not sit right with a lot of people. Three versions of events had emerged during and after the trial. Version 1, the prosecution's version, was based on the evidence of three informants who did not see who went into the house and two prisoners who were coerced into testifying against the other eight and had changed their statements after the trial. Ten men were at the house. The door was kicked in and three men entered and viciously carried out the murders. No motive ever established by the prosecution. Version 2, Tom Casey and Anthony Philbin. Both men had been coerced into changing their statements. But Tom had stated that Anthony was not even present that night and two of the men that were there were still walking free. Does this mean that some of the men were innocent? Were the informants lying? Or were there 12 men there that night? Version 3. Based on the revised testimony of the two condemned men, Patrick Joyce and Patrick Casey, who admitted their own guilt and alluded to Miles Joyce's innocence. They also stated that Tom Casey had killed two, if not three, of the Joyce's. Anthony Philbin, who had testified on behalf of the prosecution, was not even present and lied. There were so many inconsistencies in the case. When the public became aware of the new statements from Patrick Casey and Patrick Joyce, people were convinced of Miles's innocence. There was a public outcry over the injustice. It was even debated at the House of Commons and a public inquiry was demanded by the people. 
From 1883, Irish politicians were speaking out about the murders and all the inconsistencies, bringing special attention to the execution of Miles Joyce, where it was becoming more apparent he was an innocent man. He had an alibi. His wife claimed to be with him all night that particular night. Joseph Bigger, the MP for Cavan, was unwavering in his criticism of Lord Spencer, calling him a bloodthirsty old English peer, saying, I will always call Earl Spencer a murderer. He hanged an innocent man. In 1884, Tom Casey admitted he lied. He stated he had been there but had testified for the prosecution to ensure his freedom. The local parish priest, through his sermons, would condemn Tom calling out people who had perjured themselves in the case for their freedom. So after much pressure, Tom admitted to the priest that he had actually been untruthful. The Archbishop of Tume made Tom kneel before him at Mass and admit in front of all the parishioners he had lied. Before long, the news reached the Freeman's Journal and they interviewed Tom, who again admitted his deceit. He stated that Anthony Philbin had also lied. He said that they were both threatened by the Crown Prosecution, George Bolton, that they would most definitely hang if they did not testify. All the outrage and publicity gave hope to the other men languishing in jail. It was again raised in the House of Commons, but was rejected as lies by both Casey and Philbin. The government claimed they had changed their story out of fear of retribution from the neighbours who would want vengeance for the hangings. But the pressure kept coming. The Archbishop of Tume wrote to the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland demanding the investigation be reopened. National and international papers ran the story. It even made the New York Times. But the British government refused to bow to pressure. Lord Spencer refusing to admit he had hung an innocent man. In 1884, a motion was put before Parliament demanding a public inquiry. It would be debated for four days. William Gladstone, the Prime Minister, backed Lord Spencer, saying an inquiry would bring into question Lord Spencer's honour and he could not go along with that. The motion was defeated by 219 votes to 48. The British establishment wanted the Mount Trasna murders and ensuing trial to go away. It was obvious they were not interested in pursuing truth and justice. There would be no posthumous pardon for Miles Joyce or retrial for the men serving life. In 1895, Michael Casey died aged 73 in prison, the one definite guilty party. In 1900, John Casey, who was innocent, died in prison. He had served 18 years. His body was never returned to his family. In 1902, the remaining men were released after serving out their sentence of 20 years. Two of them were brothers of Miles Joyce, as well as one of his nephews. They went home on the train from Dublin to Ballinrobe and walked the final 18 miles home. But what really happened that night? What was the real story? We know three of the eight convicted were definitely guilty. There was more than likely at least seven people present that night, which would conclude that four of the guilty party may not have even been tried. But who were the seven? The suspected seven were named in the papers back in the 1880s. In 1884, MP Timothy Harrington wrote a book naming the supposed guilty parties. He went to Mam Trasna and interviewed Tom Casey, who we now know was definitely there. He named the others present. One of particular interest was a fella named Big John Casey, who he claimed arranged the murders. He had been originally arrested after the killings, but was released when the informants came forward and named the 10 men that were then arrested. Timothy Harrington also commented on the fact that no motive was ever established. After several interviews, Tom stated Big John Casey, John Joyce the victim and others involved in the murder were part of a secret society. These societies were dotted around the country, but were particularly rife in the West. They carried out attacks on people who they thought had dishonoured their communities in some way. For example, like snitching to the police on someone. According to Tom's accounts, Big John and John Joyce were at odds over the issue of sheep stealing in the neighbourhood. 
It was alleged that John Joyce had tried to kill Big John on at least three occasions. He had threatened the police on John Joyce, but John Joyce had warned Big John he would name every member of the secret society if Big John went to the police. This was allegedly the reason for the murders, according to Tom Casey. But can his new account be trusted? He said the intention was to kill everyone in the house. But why kill the whole family and not just John, if the story is to be believed? Plus the men in the family were killed differently to the women. Was there a reason for this? To this day, the real motive still eludes us. It was revealed that the three informants got well paid for their testimony, but they were ostracised by the people of Mamtrasna. Anthony Joyce was drinking in Boyle's pub in Churchfield near Mamtrasna one evening when an argument broke out between him and a relative of Miles Joyce. Anthony hit him and other punters joined in in the defence of Miles's relative. Anthony came out of the fight with most of his nose missing. Patsy and Martin Joyce, the surviving children of John Joyce, never came back to Mamtrasna. They were put into the care of the Christian brothers in Artane. After leaving Artane, they both emigrated to America. Patsy was never heard from again, but Martin did return to Ireland after some years. His son fought in the 1916 Rising. Another son was playing for Dublin against Tipperary on Bloody Sunday in November 1920, but survived. Descendants of the Joyce family still live today and welcomed the posthumous pardon of Miles Joyce 136 years after the trial in Dublin in 2018. In the presence of President Michael D. Higgins, the family finally got the pardon that they so wished for following a commissioned report by Dr. Neve Howland of UCD. This report found his conviction to be unsafe. Miles' pleas for innocence were finally acknowledged. I stumbled upon this case when I was researching what episode I would like to cover next and I found it absolutely intriguing. I couldn't believe I'd never heard of it before. The murders in themselves were brutal enough, but what followed was an unbelievable tale of betrayal, lies, abuse of power and ultimately the death of an innocent man. I hope you found this episode delving into this historical case as interesting as I did. I hope to bring you more equally as intriguing in the future. So guys, thanks for joining me on Ireland Crimes and Mysteries today. I hope you enjoyed exploring the darker side of Ireland with me. If you have any suggestions for future episodes or would like to share your thoughts on the cases we've covered, please feel free to leave a comment. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel to stay up to date for all my latest episodes. Until our next investigation, keep your eyes open and your mind curious. You've been listening to Island Crimes and Mysteries with Nils. Join us for another episode coming real soon.